Well, Maddie, it is so nice to have you on the show. It's really funny because we have really played a little bit of phone tag and reschedule here for a bit. So it's been a long time coming, like months in the making. And I'm so excited that our time is here. So welcome. Dude, we made it happen. You know, first I got you on my show and the uh, uh, overwhelming positive response that we received uh, from our conversation was was awesome. I feel like you and I share a lot of similarities in terms of kind of our, our values and our beliefs and and how we attack investing and, and lifestyle. So um, uh, any any conversation that I get to have with the Justin Donald, you know, I'm going to take take you up on that. Oh, you're too kind. Well, I had a ton of fun on your show. And, you know, it's really fun just seeing the engagement that you get from different communities when you're a guest and the people that reach out and connect. And it's just always so fun to meet new people from, you know, different worlds, different networks. And so you have just a massive following. Can you hear me? We can edit this out. Don't don't sweat it. For some, for some reason, it just, uh, I have no idea what happened. It just literally, um, maybe it's it the AirPods. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take those off and make sure those are put away. I'm just going to put you on my, um, it did it though earlier too. I don't know if that was on my side. So my apologies. Let's give oh, that no a worries. And, and the cool thing about this is we can edit anything in and anything cool. out. So yep. Don't sweat it. Cool. I'll just do that for you, Charlie. Um, okay. So l- let me just, uh, jump back into that last part. Um, you know, it, it's really cool to see the followings that each of us have and, and you know, really just meeting fun people from each other's networks. It's really fun. And I got to tell you, you have an incredible following. People just love you. You've got your own podcast. You got your network there. You've got the Go Abundance crew and people just swear by you and your team and your expertise. I have so many people that say, well, Maddie said, you know, this, and, uh, and you got like a million different names, which you got to get into as well. Uh, nicknames that is, but, uh, you know, how did you build such a great following? Um, I got a really big payroll. So I just pay people, you know, a lot of, (laughs) no, (laughs) um, you know, I, I've, I've thought about this and I I had a, actually, uh, somebody asked me this question the other day and, um, I've kind of boiled it down over the course of the years to what I call the likability formula. Um, and we all kind of know those people that when you're around them and you leave that, you know, experience or conversation or whatever it may be, um, you go, ah, oh, man, I just really like that person. You know, like I, I want to be friends with them or I want to be around them or, you know, they, they fire me up, they inspire me. And we all know who those people are. And I've always, you know, um, wanted and aspired and held myself accountable to being one of those people. And so when I kind of boiled down, this was uh, a mutual friend of ours, David Osborne. Um, and he's, you know, been a mentor of mine. I met David when I was 24, uh, 25. And, um, you know, I got in proximity to him because I am a big believer that, you know, we, uh, we grow into the conversations, we grow into the environments that we really choose to engage with and put ourselves in. And um, I kind of have two different stories in terms of one, uh, not so good uh, based on the people that I I was surrounding myself with and the environments I was putting myself in and the results that came uh, because of that. And also the opposite. Um, But in this context, uh, dealing with people like David Osborne, who very wealthy and financially abundant, but also somebody who lives very intentionally and purposefully in all kind of gardens or categories of life. And, um, I was shocked that someone like him would mentor and be as open and as, you know, supportive to someone like me. And, um, I asked him, I was like, man, why, why are you, why are you helping me? I'm just curious why you're mentoring me. Cause I want to know, you know, I want to know what are these things or qualities or characteristics, you know, people like you look for so that I can make sure to spotlight and, you know, kind of sharpen my ax in those areas for future mentors or relationships that I want to build. And he goes, uh, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, man. I just like you and I want to see you win. And I've heard more and more people say that over and over because I like to ask those questions. I'm a big question asker. I believe that, you know, the quality of the questions that we ask in our lives dictate the quality of answers we get. And sometimes 
um, we miss, a lot of people miss those opportunities to ask those questions in whatever capacity or context of life it is. And so as I was, you know, engaging more and more people along my journey, um, some of the things that kept coming up kind of helped me form what I call the likability formula or the likability equation. And um, number one is uh, a part of one, the variable in that equation is, is humility. Um, you know, no matter how successful, how quote unquote awesome somebody says somebody else is, when somebody shows up with this sense of humility to uh, a conversation or an engagement, um, it really kind of breaks down the barriers and creates this connectivity, this authenticity that, you know, whether you're rich, poor, successful, you know, in the middle of your journey, just beginning, um, it allows this bridge to be built for two people to connect. The second piece of that equation is confidence. So I've always known that I'm, you know, not the, the smartest, I'm not the fastest, I'm not the strongest, but I am confident in my ability and who I am and how I show up um, that, you know, if I don't know something, I can figure it out, or there's some way that I can bring the third piece of this value. If you're somebody that is always looking to add value into every experience, opportunity, situation that you're a part of, um, and you couple all of that with just being a really hard worker, it just makes, it makes somebody likable. And so those were things that I see in other people, um, and I admire in other people, and I want to go and help those people, and I want to push them and challenge them and support them in, you know, achieving whatever it is that they want. And at the same time, you know, it's something that I always look to elevate in myself uh, because it's characteristics and qualities that I admire in others too. And so I think that is maybe one little, you know, piece of my identity in terms of those being, you know, kind of qualities that um, I admire in others and that I want to, you know, elevate and enhance and uphold in myself. And uh, when you, you know, can do those things, it really does allow you to connect anybody and everybody. One of the first interviews I ever did on my podcast um, was with Robert Herjavec from Shark Tank. And I remember asking him this question and it kind of, I'll close the loop on that, but it ties into, you know, how to connect and build a great network and to meet people um, of all different types of backgrounds, you know, races, ethnicities, uh, economics, business and industry. I mean, you name it. And um, I've always been a very curious person. And when I was asking him this question of, you know, what is one thing he spoke very highly of his father, his father was one of his mentors, his father had passed away. And basically, in his death that he had said, um, I said, what was one of the things that your father told you that still applies today as it did the first day in business to where you're at today with all the success that you've accumulated? And he said, you know, the one thing that my dad taught me was, Every single person that you interact with has something to teach you, but it's nobody's responsibility to give you that information or wisdom or value, but your own. And so that kind of tied into, you know, my approach of going, man, I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask questions and I'm going to be genuinely interested in people. And I'm going to be genuinely focused on how I can bring value or connect dots and, you know, figure out ways to be somebody that is a, a multiplier and an addition instead of a subtractor and a divider, which unfortunately we see, you know, um, both sides of that in today's landscape. And so, that's something that I always, you know, consistently uh, lead with on a daily basis is going out and how can I add value to people? How can I show up with humility? How can I bring confidence and not only, you know, in myself, but maybe breathe some of that into other people as others have done that for me on my journey. And when you look up after, you know, 11, 12 years of doing that, um, one, you realize you got a pretty cool group of people that you have access to with great opportunities. Um, but at the same time, you know, it has really allowed me to build some very genuine, authentic relationships um, that, you know, others like for like, they, they see that and they recognize that. And, um, and I think that's, you know, a very great way to go and build out a network and, um, you know, appreciate your, uh, your relationships. Wow, Maddie, there, there's so much wisdom in what you just shared. I mean, we could unpack every single one of those points that you made. Uh, it, it was just tremendous. You know, I, I remember back, uh, this is a decade ago, I read a book called The Likeability Factor by Tim Sanders. 
And, oh, wow. There's actually a book on it. Yes. And so, you know, and, and by the way, his likability, um, you know, keys are different than yours. There's some shared, but some different. So like you have your own, but that was my first exposure or experience beyond um, how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. I mean, I, yep. I really think those are the two books Amazing that book. most greatly influenced my uh, intentionality on likability and relationship building and just being intentional with connecting with people. Um, and I had the privilege of hearing Tim Sanders speak and give a message to our company at yeah. that time. And it was incredible. And, and the lessons that I learned were great. And so you, you're just so spot on that when you are likable, there's just so much more good stuff that happens. I was talking with someone earlier today, uh, someone interviewing for the Lifestyle Investor Mastermind. And um, one of the things that uh, he shared with me is that he felt that um, relationships were just so important to him. And it's more important than any net worth or money he could ever make. And I agreed with him. And I said that that's exactly the type of person that I'm looking for in our mastermind, because uh, relationships are, are infinitely more important than money and net worth. And it takes a lot of people a lifetime to figure that out. They, they figure it out on their dying bed when they don't have more of it or when it's running low and when, when time is running thin and, and, uh, but other people, they figure it out early on in life and the irony of it all, Maddie, and you get this is the better relationships you have. Ultimately, the more success you're going to have the more financial success the more business success because it takes people in good relationships yeah and great people want to be with other great people you know they they realize there there's some catalyst or or event or experience in your life where um you realize and, and ultimately right you prioritize uh accordingly based on you know your core values and based on you know the people you really want to do life with. And, you know, financially early on in my career, I was doing well, but I also realized, you know, I do a quarterly exercise and I basically draw a line down the center of a piece of paper. I put multiplication and addition sign on the left side. I put a subtraction and a division sign on the right side. And I kind of go back and look at my quarter and reflect on who I spent the most time with. Right. And we all know that kind of cliched statement and it's cliche because it's so true. And people say it over and over. Um, but I realized that, you know, a lot of the people that I was surrounding myself with were kind of, you know, they were gossiping and they were kind of negative and they were naysayers and pessimistic and, and always uh, why I can't do something instead of how can I do something. Mm. And so I really started getting a lot more intentional around my relationships. Um, and I kind of drew some, you know, some lines in the sand, honestly, around, who I was going to engage with. Not that I wasn't going to still show love and appreciation and respect to those people, but I also kind of raised the standard of what I would and wouldn't tolerate in my life, uh, in my business, in my network, in my circle. And it was amazing when, when you kind of, when you set standards for whether it's your life or your business or your health or whatever it may be, um, there's a way that you can call people up to those standards and give them an opportunity to go on that journey with you, or you can feel comfortable and still love and respect, you know, and appreciate letting them go on their own journey, but keeping them at a distance. And as I did that more and more, and I kind of evolved in how I was having those conversations and, you know, kind of breaking some of those, I guess, ties, you could call them. Um, it's amazing when you allow, you know, people to get off the bus what room it creates for the people who align with those standards to get onto the bus and how that can transform. I mean, your financial future, your business, your friendships, your family, even. Um, and, you know, sometimes I get that question asked a lot of the times is, you know, what if that negative person is your spouse or it's your, you know, your mom or your dad or your best friend forever. And, um, and again, I think, you know, when people come from a place of true love and, and it's obviously how you can communicate it, um, to call someone up instead of calling them out, call them up to a higher version of themselves and kind of show them that path and, and put a hand out and allow them to come on that journey with you. You know, those kind of tough conversations, those are leadership conversations, but those are also the conversations that, 
not only have transformed my life, but you get to see what the people who do opt into that, what it does to transform their life and how appreciative and how loyal they become and how much they want to add value to you because of that. And so, um, you know, drawing those lines in the sand and, and creating those standards for your life, I think are really, really important. I think a lot of people sacrifice and, um, and play down to other people's standards instead of calling people and holding people accountable to their own. And the people that I really admire and respect, I'm um, going to have learned a great deal from, uh, they're ruthless in their standards. One of my favorite quotes and, you know, kind of one of my mantras that I live by is I'm a loving human being, but my standards are not. And, um, you know, I can still show love and appreciation for people that may not align with my standards, but it doesn't mean that I have to sacrifice my standards to make them feel comfortable about the life that they're choosing to lead and live. So I think that's something that, you know, as people get more confident, as well as more clear on what those things are, who they are, what they stand for. Um, I just said, man, I just want to, I want to do more of life with people that I love that inspire me, that challenge me. Um, and sometimes those are tough conversations too. And, you know, some of my greatest mentors have said things that have like, Oh, that hurt, man. But it was also the truth. And it was what called me up to a higher version of myself. And that's something that I try and do for other people as well. You know, you, you've mentioned so many great things here that we talk a lot about on this podcast, one of them being your peer group, another one being mentors. And I think it's imperative to be intentional about where you're spending time, because to take what you said a step further or a step in another direction, if you're not intentional, you're going to have a life by default and you're going to have relationships by default. And that doesn't mean that they can't be great relationships. And, and you might, you know, maybe you luck into just some great by default relationships, but right. the likelihood is that that is not the case that you not only need to be intentional with the relationships that you're in, but you need to be intentional about who those relationships are going to be on the onset, you know, who are those people? And so something that my wife and I do every single year is we sit down and we plan out our year and we figure out, hey, who are the couples that are most important to us that we want to make sure that we get time with? And then for me personally, it's who's my top 10? Who do I need to make sure that I'm scheduling flights to see? I'll fly them in. I'll go see them. But, you know, maybe it's not a couple thing, but maybe it's just a one on one. Um, and, and recognizing, Hey, who are your one-on-one -on -one relationships? And then who are your couple relationships? Because, uh, they may not be the same, or you might have, uh, each have a spouse that there's nothing like bad. There's no animosity, but maybe they just don't resonate the way that you and that person resonate. And so, right. uh, and then I have a category of mentors who are going to be my mentors for the year. And you talked about David Osborne. I've just learned a ton from him. He's been in my mentor category. Uh, and really has just been a wealth of knowledge, just loves to share and loves to give. But I think it's important that you have these people in your life that pull you up, that um, make you want to be more of a man or more of a woman and to show up in a way that is better than how you're showing up today. Even yeah. if you're showing up, you know, stupendously today, that they make you want to be better. They inspire you. It's one of those things I call them my board of directors. So based on all the gardens of my life, I have kind of role models and mentors in each of those categories. And, you know, some may be in close proximity or accessible to you. Some of them may be, you know, a, an online influencer or Tony Robbins or right. But, but knowing who those people are, then when it's time to, whether it's in time of crisis or, or it's in time of opportunity, you can, you can be that much more purposeful and pointed at who you engage with, knowing that these are the individuals that you want to model after, that you want to duplicate and replicate results or qualities or outcomes that they have. And, you know, this isn't for me, I don't just look at, you know, financial or business success. I look at, you know, do they have a good relationship with their partner or their spouse? Do they have a uh, connection and, you know, respect and, uh, you know, spend that time with their kids? Do they give to charities and communities? I look at the whole picture because 
Um, for me, I've made a choice that I don't allow people to speak into my life from a character standpoint, if I don't feel aligned with their core values. Now, if you can just teach me a strategy and a skill, and it's just, we're talking about running a play cool. I'm all ears, but if you're going to speak into grooming my character or shaping my identity, um, those are things that I really, you know, pay attention to. And I suggest people, you know, go a couple layers deeper, peel back the layers to the onion to make sure that, you know, what uh, source you're drinking from is, is something that's going to nourish and elevate um, and enhance your body, your mind, your spirit, your, you know, your, um, your, your, your whole being versus it just being something that um, maybe the complete opposite. So uh, at the, the details of life, right, are are so important. And I'm not a detail oriented guy, by the way. I I move fast. I talk fast. Um, you know, one of my early assistants told me, it, like you, it's like you're chucking bowling balls over your shoulder all, all the time, and you're expecting us to catch them and organize them. So I've gotten a little bit better about some of those things. But um, at the end of the day, right, you have to know what's your north star, and you know what are you moving towards. And you know a lot of people lack clarity. When I ask people what do they want for their lives or their lifestyle, right? And it's uh, well, I want to make more money, or I want to travel more, I want more time doing X or with this person Y. But they're not like crystal clear on exactly what that looks like, and it becomes very hard to make decisions in the busy, distracted world we live in when you're not crystal clear on what that is. So when you can get clear on what that vision looks like for you in all of those areas of life. And that's why I reiterate my three-year vision every single year um, and why I track those progress and goals and milestones quarterly. And we break it down monthly and we get so granular one because that's not my personality. And I know that in order for me to be able to do those things as purposefully, as intentionally, as efficiently as I possibly can, I need to make sure that I'm clear on what my North star is. So that way, every decision I make is aligned with that is congruent with that. Cause if it's not, it's just a distraction and it might be serving my ego, but it's not serving the outcomes and desires that I have for my life. And so those are some of the frameworks that I built around my non-organized is my non-detailed self knowing that, Hey, these are my bumpers to my bowling alley to make sure I'm not bowling gutter balls and I'm still knocking down pins. And with these types of frameworks, I'm giving my, myself the best chance to hit a strike or a spare. Yeah, that is powerful. And I love what you talked about with alignment of core values. And, you know, that's where you let people speak into your life from a character standpoint. I think that that's so powerful, you know, on a few levels, like one of the things that I think is important is that you're clear and you're intentional about who you're spending time with. But then the next level is that you are intentional with the questions you're asking and the engagement that you're giving inside of those relationships. Because to just be clear is not good enough on on who you want to spend time with, but to actually take a relationship to the depth that it can go that takes quality time. And that takes um, a, a discipline and a desire to want to go there and to be willing to be vulnerable and be transparent. Uh, and I love what you talked about with kind of family values. You know, how, how are they relationally? How are they with their spouse? How are they with their kids? Because these are things I look for. Yep. And uh, I think that that is just imperative. So um, let's, and by the way, I'm so excited that uh, we were able to connect right now here in this moment. Uh, I, I was going to, you know, we talked off air about this, but uh, this is the last episode I'm doing in, in my home studio. And uh, I'm tearing this thing down, like, you know, pretty much right when we're done. We're, we're bringing the house down, dude. <laughs> Bring it down. And I'm going to be in a new location. And I, I actually don't know when it's going to be because we're in the process of, of building and, uh, you know, not, nothing goes to uh, the timeline that you think it's going to be on. And so of course. I don't know when I'm going to podcast again. I've got enough episodes for the rest of the year, but um, it, it'll be interesting to see uh, what, um, you know, kind of what that new setup looks like, but I'm just excited that you get to close it out. You know, you're the, the final episode in this location. Cause I'm really enjoying the content that you're bringing. Uh, and I even love to transition into you and a lot of the success you've had. Cause I think you started just flipping homes, right? Like, a th- there are a good number of people. I feel like that got a good start flipping homes. You, you buy a home, you rehab it, you sell it for a little bit more, hopefully, maybe you don't the first couple of times or as much as you think. 
Um, and then you do it again and you keep reinvesting those dollars and get more homes. And this is a way to, you know, earn income. It's a little bit different than buying and holding where you have that passive income. And I know you do a lot more of that today, but I'd love to hear your story because you, you flipped at least a hundred homes, probably hundreds of homes. Yep. I'd love to hear how you got your start. Yeah. Um, well, I graduated from, um, from college with a really expensive piece of paper that I knew I was going to do absolutely nothing with. Um, <laughs> and as I was interviewing for jobs, 30 to $40,000 a year, I went, well, this is not aligned or congruent with my goals and the life that I've, you know, got envisioned for myself. And, um, I kind of had, you know, one day I was sitting, um, at home, uh, after moving back in with my parents and, um, I was, you know, writing down a, what I called my career hit list. And it was, you know, kind of all the things that at that time I was looking for, which was, um, I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted, you know, the, the freedom and flexibility of being, uh, an entrepreneur. I wanted no ceiling on what I could make financially. So I didn't want to be capped from an income perspective. I wanted to be in a space that allowed me to help people and, you know, help others achieve their goals, provide value. Um, I wanted somewhat of that lifestyle to design the sexiness that goes along with the, all of that. But as I got to the very end, um, I wrote something down and it was, I want to create wealth. And when I started looking at all the industries and jobs, quote unquote, that were out there, um, I kept coming back to real estate and I was scouring Craigslist one day and I saw literally one of those ads of mentor seeks mentee, da, 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 da. Right. And so I called the guy. Um, this was back in 2010 when there were a significant amount of foreclosures and, you know, kind of the recovery, uh, you know, beginning or really finding the bottom of the market um, back in 2010. And I ended up um, working for a guy for almost a year. Uh, we flipped over 100 houses that first year and I learned project me. I was basically doing everything and he was clipping, you know, 50, 60, 70, sometimes $100,000 a house. Um, and I literally was making nothing. And it was the best education I'd ever gotten. Um, it gave me the confidence and the know-how to believe at 21 years old, I could go and do this for myself. And so um, I started hunting down and lead generating um, for deals myself. And uh, after a bunch of FUs and no's and, you know, door shut in my face, um, I found that one uh, house and it was uh, literally the glorified cat lady house. She had over stray cats inside of her home. How many? Um, hundred stray cats. Oh my goodness sakes. And so when you walk up in that house, I mean, it was like you got karate kicked by Garfield and the smell of pee, right? It was just overwhelming. Um, and at the same time, you know, this nostalgic you know, smell uh, was success to me. It was what gave me this opportunity, this stepping stone to get on this journey myself. I bought it for 75,000. Um, I put about 30 into it, let's say, and I sold it for 210,000, uh, three months later. And so from going, you know, living at home, a couple hundred bucks in my savings account, some credit cards, no credit. Um, I was able to creatively fund and structure the entire deal with hundred percent of other people's money. And it was like that light bulb went off in my head of going instead of me, which I heard at the time, all of the reasons why I couldn't do it. I need to start asking myself, how do I continue to make this happen over and over and over again? And my brain, after asking that question, went to work and figured out how do I do more of these with none of my own money? And so I'm um, over the course of the last 10 years, I'm um, flipping hundreds of houses using 100% of other people's money. Um, that kind of got me into that investor uh, path. I built up uh, a real estate team uh, for five years with my business partner at the same time. So we were listing all of the flips. We were getting all of the leads. We were still servicing retail buyers as well and sellers. Um, and, you know, we made it two years back to back to the top uh, 1000 teams ranked in Wall Street Journal. And um, I realized I just wasn't passionate about that. Um, but I partnered with a construction company to kind of have all of these ancillary businesses that were serving and cross pollinating and supporting one another. Um, but I got to a place where I started looking at my income and my time and the return on my time was far greater in the investing arena than it was in the real estate and the construction side of things. Um, so I really kind of planted my flag and went all in there. Um, but as you know, right, it was still a job. You know, I was only as good as my last flip or the next one in my pipeline. 
And so I realized I needed to start keeping some of these assets. So I started holding some of my single families um, and kind of doing the birth strategy where I'd get them, I'd fix them up. We'd put a tenant in there, I'd season them and I'd go and refinance out all of the um, the capital and I'd own 100% of these assets and still cash flow on them. And in California, if you can do that and you get to capture all the you know, upside and appreciation, which we get in being really a heavy appreciation state, not necessarily um, a great cash flow state, but I was finding some of those. So anything that I could cash flow, I would hold. Um, and then I started to um, you know, kind of get a little bit bigger and go into duplexes and then fourplexes. And then that led me into buying commercial strip centers. Um, and so I've been buying commercial strip centers every year. Um, and then uh, I fell into the hospitality world and um, thought I could uh, buy a hotel and it was going to be just like real estate investing and it would be passive, no big deal. Um, and that was a living, breathing, you know, 24, seven, 365 business. It was almost like a startup. Um, and, uh, I actually fell in love with it. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, it was um, scary. I mean, I thought the ship was going down and um, I had to let my staff go. And I was forced to kind of dig back into that business um, from you know cleaning to the housekeeping to laundry to everything. But it was a blessing because it also taught me so much about the industry. Um, now I have three hotels up in Lake Tahoe. We're working on a 122 uh, ground up luxury boutique hotel in downtown San Antonio on the Riverwalk. It's an opportunity zone. Um, and then over the course of those years, at the same time, just through my network, the podcast, uh, mastermind groups, I kind of stumbled my way into private equity um, and, and hedge funds and family offices and kind of placing equity into development um, and other, you know, types of real estate assets and opportunities. And so um, it's been, you know, stepping stone after stepping stone after stepping stone, definitely a lot of failing forward that happens every single day. Um, we celebrate that in our, you know, kind of ecosystem and team and environment um, that, you know, we're pushing and growing. Um, and, and those kind of face plants are, are celebrated and welcomed uh, as long as you get up and you brush yourself off and you, you know, continue to improve and grow from those opportunities. Um, you know, you don't stop. There's no way you're going to lose, um, you know, and, and that's our mindset and mentality. And uh, it's been a really fun journey, man. It's um, I'm super passionate about, you know, real estate and this vehicle as you and I share many similar, um, you know, belief systems around why this asset class is so amazing when managed, leveraged and operated properly. Um, the opportunities are, are endless in this space. Yeah, there's there's no doubt. And there are two ways to do it. There's the way that involves a lot of your time. And then yep. there's a way to do it where it is truly passive. And, you know, we, we should dissect that a little bit. But before we do, you're very well known in your circles for using other people's money to fund deals. So you said your very first deal, the, the cat house, Yep. Um, this one was creatively funded and I, I'd love to hear how you do it because a lot of people, you know, if, if you're not into flips and you've never done this and you're like, how do I do it? You know, it seems like a lot of money. Um, there are creative ways you can do it. There's seller finance that exists. You can get loans for all the rehab work that you would do in a home that then, uh, you would pay back once you flipped the home. So there are ways to do it where it's not a lot of out of pocket costs, but I'd love to hear how you structured your first one. And if there are any differences on some of the future ones that you learned, um, you know, with some, you know, hacks some investment hacks, I'd love to hear them. Yeah. I mean, my, um, my mindset that I try and instill in everybody, especially the new investors, being that the biggest hurdle, right? I mean, this was my biggest mental and what felt like a physical hurdle was I'm living at home with my dad. I have $800 in my bank account. Like I got a $2,500 credit card limit and it's already maxed out. Like how that nobody's going to give me money. I've never even bought a house for myself. Let alone, you know, why, why would somebody give me money? And one of my very first mentors, she said, find the deal. And if it's really a deal, the money will follow. And, and I, and I believed her and, and that I adopted that mindset. And so when I said, find the deal, and if it's really a deal, the money will follow. Um, I found the deal. Um, I underwrote it. And again, I didn't know what I didn't know. I thought it was a great deal. I had a much greater deal in my hands than I even knew. And 
she said, you go to a private money lender or quote unquote, a hard money lender. Um, and you're going to see how good of a deal it is because they're going to base their LTV off of, you know, how deep of a discount you really have in that deal. So they ended up funding 90% of my purchase price of that $75,000 price tag. They funded 90% of that. And they said, we'll give you hundred percent of that rehab budget as well. Um, so you basically just have to come up with a 10% down payment that's missing. And ultimately what I did was, um, I, you know, there's th really three circles of people that you can go and, you know, try and find money from, for that kind of second position. You have kind of your inner circle. We'll call that mom, dad, family, really, really close friends. You have your outer circle, um, which is, you know, kind of your people that you associate with might know in your networks and then kind of your social circle, maybe people that you work with or in your industry online. You know, I've raised a lot of money in, you know, Facebook groups and at, you know, mastermind events and things like that. So, um, you know, I remember just pounding the phones and, and trying to connect with as many people as I could to get that last 10%. What I did was not only that 10%, I said, you know what, I'm going to be holding this property for maybe three to six months. So let me get six months of holding costs and mortgage payments um, wrapped up into that second uh, as well. So that way it's no out of pocket money for me. Cause I don't have money to pay the mortgage payment. I don't have money to even pay the utility bills. So let me figure out how to get that figured out. Um, I gave them a flat interest and a couple points, points, meaning interest points on that total amount. Um, and they basically funded uh, the remaining funds needed to close on that property. And I was off and running um, the, the bank, you know, or the hard money lender funded the, ma the majority of the first. Um, then, you know, my second lender came in and covered uh, the remainder of what was left. We closed escrow. We started the rehab process, got everything ready to rock, put it on the market. Um, and obviously, you know, that amount, that 75,000 plus that 30, that 105 out of the 210 that I sold it for got paid off and the remainder came to, to me. Um, there are many different ways though that you can do this, right? You can um, bring a capital partner in and split the profits 50-50. Um, th there's so many different ways. I always tell people when you're first getting started, instead of trying to do it all on your own, um, Go to someone like Justin, go to someone like me, go to some other investor in your market or in your network that you trust, that you know has experience, that you know has a good track record, that you know has all of the team that you need. So that way you get that learning curve really shortened up. You get it expedited. You know you're going to get quality results. You know you're going to get to tap into other resources and networks that have taken those individuals years, sometimes decades to build. And that kind of learning lesson, that kind of network, those kind of resources, that's priceless. And I always tell people, this is my mentality. I'd rather own a slice of a watermelon than hundred percent of nothing or a raisin. And, you know, when you're first starting out, go and bring that watermelon to somebody and slice it up. And, you know, everybody wins. And now you're going to have some real momentum behind you. You're going to have a newfound confidence to know that the next opportunity you find, right, you're going to get the ability to get that across the finish line. And maybe you start structuring things differently as you get more maybe of your own money, or you've got a little bit more leverage in terms of your experience or what you can bring to the table. Um, but yeah, just little breadcrumbs along the trail, right? Just keep following those and um, you're going to end up, you know, in a, in a space um, and, you know, along the trail at some point in time, when you look up and look back and go, wow, I've actually covered a lot of ground and holy cow, I got a lot of tools on my tool belt now that I can actually put to work. And those are things that people overlook. The money is great, but don't look at what you're giving up. Look at what you're getting and look at now how you can use that for, I can use working for that guy for almost a year for free. Well, guess what? I used what he taught me. And yeah, maybe I could have made two or three hundred thousand dollars if he was, you know, paying me accordingly, but he gave me a gift that went out and made me a lot of money over the course of the next decade uh, because I went in and learned. So that is one of the things that I think um, people often overlook is they want to they don't want to give up too much. Um, but really you have to always remember like what are you gaining? And if you're playing the long-term game how much value and ROI can you turn on what you gained by 
applying that for the rest of your career, your investing life. That's right. Yeah. You, there's a return that you get on the money and then there's a return that you get on the education or the mentorship. Yes. And so that's why it's good to own a small piece of a big pie because you learn so much in the process. Yep. So, you know, people all the time want the whole pie, but what if the whole pie only, you know, two X's when you can have a slice of a pie that a hundred times X or, you know, a thousand X, whatever it is. And so yep. it's, it's just so smart to not be greedy and to be generous. I try and coach people all the time to be more generous and more giving on the equity side than whatever you think you should, because you only need a piece. You only need a part of it. And you might as well have a bunch of people in there that are good at the thing that they do that help grow that pie. And those are people that do it without your time. Yep. So everyone wins. It's a true win-win. And you know, you, you had mentioned in your example here, and I love that you were able to do this with no money down out of your own pocket, uh, $7,500 plus, uh, which is a 10% plus, you know, three to six months of mortgage and utilities, yep. so whatever that ended up coming out to. Um, what I love about it is, so you've got someone that comes in the second position. So your primary lender, the hard money lender um, or private lender, they would be in the first position. They'd have a lien, a first lien on that property. Something goes wrong. Yep. They take that property. They're happy to do that trade all day because they know the value of it. Right. The second position, though, they're, they don't have uh, that same security, right? The, the private lender is never going to sign off on that. They, they want the asset if something goes wrong. Yep. So generally, you got to offer something a little bit more attractive. And that's why you said you are, uh, offered percentages and then a couple of points, meaning you just paid a percentage like off the top based on the total Correct. value of the loan that you would just owe them no matter what, no matter how long you borrowed that money for. Yep. Um, and so I just want our listeners to kind of understand how that works being in first position versus second position and the value prop and, you know, just the, the risk reward ratio needs to be there. Now, yeah. in this instance, the, there was enough value in the property that the person in the second position felt pretty good. Exactly. That's, that's the key there that I always tell people is, you know, when you go borrow in other people's money for second position, you, you are stewarding their capital and responsible for their capital in a way that is different than the first. And so you really have to make sure you're underwriting very, very accordingly to insulate um, and mitigate their risk. The last thing, and thank God I've never lost anybody's money. I don't plan on doing that. But it's one of those things where you better make sure that you are, if you're going to take 100% of you know, what is necessary to lock that deal up and close on that deal, that everybody's money is safe in that deal and that even in a worst case scenario, you know, they're going to get made whole. And, and that's really important. I think all people, especially guys, um, understanding that your career is much bigger than one deal and you go and you mess up one deal, it can also ruin your investing career and your reputation. And so I've been fortunate enough to build a great reputation with all of my LPs and all of my investors who've given me capital, trusted me to grow their money um, through my business and the vehicle and the product that I've chosen, which is real estate. And knowing that I plan on doing this for, you know, I'm 33. I plan on doing this into my 80s. Now, I don't know, as long as I can pick up a damn pen and, you know, look at a, a real estate deal, I'll do it because I love it. But at the same time, you have to realize like this is, I always say, whether it's wealth building, building the right relationships, building the right business, my mentality is always a marathon. Yeah, there's going to be many strategic sprints along the way, and there will be people a part of that race. But when it comes to the best things in life, you know, it's the crock pot mentality versus the microwave mindset. The microwave spits out something quick and easy and yeah, it does its job. But at the end of the day, let's be honest, all the ingredients that go into the crock pot and the time and everything fusing together always puts out a much better dish that we all get to enjoy. So when it came to building those relationships with my private lenders, earning that trust, you know, you have to make sure you're stewarding that capital properly. And that's why I was always very conservative in the beginning in terms of, 
you know, if I'm risking other people's money, I was going much more conservative on my after repair value instead of shooting for the moon, right? I was being a little bit more aggressive in terms of being a little higher on my rehab budget. And, you know, I was being a little bit more um, conservative on the timeline that it would take in order to acquire optimize and dispose of the asset. So as I built in some of those buffers, um, I was able to say, hey, does this deal still stand on its own? Does it still make sense even with those things in it? Because the last thing I want to do is shoot for the moon and say, it's not going to cost that much. And we're going to do it in three months. And I'm wrong on all three of those things. And now I just lost that person's money in second position. And they never won, want to invest with me again. And oh yeah, they're going to go and tell every single person in your network that Matt was a crap underwriter, a horrible operator. Don't ever give any of your money to him. And that was one thing that I was very, 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 very intentional about and have been from, you know, syndicating apartments and laundromats to the hotels to just flips is you have to make sure that if you're going to take other people's money, you're responsible for something that is extremely, extremely important to their livelihood, to their lifestyle. Um, and honestly, let's just be honest to their happiness. And so I, I hold that responsibility in a very, very, very high, high regard um, and integrity and ethics and making sure you're doing the right thing when it comes to investing. Hey, you want to be reckless with your own money? Go for it. But when you're talking about other people's money, there's a there's another level that um, I wish more people would operate at. And um, and you see the people who are massively successful and have had long, great, successful investing careers who have used other people's money. It's because they've gone and approached every single deal with that mindset. Yeah. And, and that's so important because as you know, I look at a lot of deals as you look at a lot of deals. And I would say yep. most people do not do a worst case scenario for underwriting. Always which guy, right? Yeah. And it's like, what, where are you getting these from? Like y- your end cap rate is probably not going to be this high. And <laughs> you're, you know, you, you can't raise rents, you know, 50% year one, like, yeah, it might be undervalued, but your pro forma is so far off. And I want people to underwrite so conservatively, so worst case scenario that uh, you're that the returns exceed expectations. You yep. know, it, it's interesting because um, there are a, a few different ways. So I, I look at this as like uh, people trying to transition into passive income, trying to get out of working for someone else. A lot of these, you know, let's call them employees they transition to business owner, but they become a slave to that business and they end up working more hours than they did as an employee. Very common. Well, in the real estate world, that happens as well, where you transition and then all of a sudden you've built this prison for yourself where you have all these properties and you don't know how to scale and you're running it yourself. And it's a very active labor intensive uh, situation or problem. But the unique thing Mm -hmm. here is, you can always figure out how to scale and always bring people in later. And so you're buying assets that produce income. And maybe there's a season where you work harder or longer to figure yes. it out, right? Yep. Um, and, and so there's a way that you can transition out. Or the other thing you could do is instead of just buying and owning deeded property, you just trust people like you and other great syndicators that run it, that find it, that have a professional um, third-party management or in-house management where they run the operation, they run that investment. And then you truly are a passive investor sitting on the sidelines. You called it an LP, a limited partner, yep. uh, while the GP or general partner or sponsor runs the investment. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because you have really had a lot of success and you've expanded your portfolio um, you know, into a lot more of the cash flowing types of, of deals. Yeah. I think again, I always ask people is what are, what are your goals and when do you want to achieve them by based on that? There's always a vehicle, a product, a market, a strategy that is most synergistic with that. And some people just don't know what those things are. Let's just narrow the lane, you know, five lane freeway of investing down to, you know, real estate investments, Syndications, as you and I both know, if you're not the sponsor and the GP and you're an LP, are literally as passive as they come. 
you wire your funds. And after doing your due diligence on the deal and the pro forma, and then of course, even more importantly, the team behind the pro forma, I see all kinds of amazing blue sky. Oh my gosh, this is the best deal type of, you know, marketing and offering memorandums. And yet at the end of the day, as I've looked in the rear view mirror and seen some of those amazing deals that can't go wrong, the teams, the syndicators, the sponsors, the operators, the managers of the deal, they suck. And so it's very, very important to make sure that if you're going to be passive and you're going to kind of give the keys to your quote unquote, you know, financial investment to somebody else that you really trust in who is stewarding the capital and making sure that what that blue sky is on the piece of paper, the pro forma spreadsheet that you're seeing is actually captured through the operations and optimization of that particular asset. So that's one way of doing it. Because I'm in the trenches and I trust in myself, I trust in my team, I failed my way forward over the last decade, and I've learned a lot, I've put a lot of tools on my tool belt, I am that syndicator. That's something that I said, I am okay with building this one, because I love it and I'm passionate about it Two because I like being the horse that people are going to bet on. I got plenty of gasoline in the tank to run many more races around the track. And I'm okay in certain capacities and contexts being very active in this. This is my operating business. So, um, so I, you know, manage and operate and own a lot of my own assets. We don't, you know, outsource operations and management on anything that I own. Um, now that being said, some of the syndications that I've done, we get great management teams in place and we vet them out. So I think, again, it always comes back to is like, what are your goals? When do you want to achieve them by, and what are you willing to do in order to get there? Are you willing to work 40 hours a week to get there for a certain period of time? You said something that stood out to me, Justin, which is, you know, there are seasons of hustle and grind to then stabilize and normalize as you kind of break through a ceiling. What do you need to do to make that your new floor and make it as passive as possible? There's been many stages of my entrepreneurial or investing journey, as I'm sure many of you can relate to of going, man, I'm working my ass off. And then a year goes by and you get some systems in place and you learn and you get more efficient. Maybe you bring some people on board to delegate and create more leverage in your life. And you're like, oh, I got 20 hours uh, freed up. What do I go and apply this to? Right. So I think, again, those are things that you have to think about. How do you scale, uh, at least in terms of time freedom, systems and infrastructure and people through your org chart? You do these things with these people and it produces that result you can find a way to make that as passive as possible. And I think that is what people need to ask themselves. So that way you don't be the one who's wearing the cap of every single department in your business. And like Justin said, being the slave to your business, you actually create something that creates freedom in your life, which is ultimately what everybody wants at the end of the day anyways, right? We want to have true freedom to make the choices that we want with our time and where we allocate that and who we allocate it with. And so that's something that I'm always thinking of right now. I'm in a season of hustle. I said, man, I'm building this hotel empire. You know, this is going to require me to roll my sleeves up. And I just came out of a season of being pretty damn passive and, you know, taking months off with my family and doing things like that. Um, and my family's on board with this. Um, and, and I, that's a big thing as well Is you know, I told myself there is no amount of money that I would ever ever go after that would sacrifice the time that I have with my kids and, and my wife. And my kids are at a, at a stage right now where they think I am the coolest mofo on the planet. And I know they probably aren't going to think that way forever, but that's my goal at least. Um, and you know, everything that I do, if I erase any time with them, I replace that time with them. And that's something that if I am going to make a decision on something that is actively going to require my time, it's a family decision now. Um, I've earned the right to do that. And I think that's another question that I often ask myself. And I tell people to ask themselves this too, is what does it take to earn the right to have X or to do Y? Hey, if you want to go take a month off and not answer your phone and you know sit on a beach somewhere or travel the world, okay, cool. Well, what does it take to earn the right to do that? 
How many months of reserves do you need in your operating account to fill that level of financial comfort? How many you know, people do you need doing X and Y activities in your business that you don't have to do anymore that you can delegate and leverage and just check in with them on? Whatever it may be, um, asking yourself, what does it take to earn the right? Because then you know what you actually one need to do. And when you do it, you know that nobody can take that away from you. It was earned, not given. And it's something that you know is sustainable. And you know that you put in the necessary due diligence and work and effort to get that outcome and enjoy that outcome. So I look at that question in all areas of my life and in particular in my investing decisions and in my businesses. But to come back and kind of close the loop on that, um, you know, I have my fundamentals. I remove emotion from my decision-making. I do heavy due diligence on people first, deal second, and I let my fundamentals tell me what the right decision is. I love it. Hey, this has been so much fun. You are the king of analogies. Your analogies are fantastic. <laughs> and I, I just love analogies because they just, they, they kind of pull everything together. So, so good. Where can our listeners and those watching, where can they learn more about you? Uh, you can always go to my website, mattachison.com or Millionaire Mindcast. I'm putting out three episodes a week. I've been doing that for, you know, four plus years now on my podcast. Um, I'm always posting on Instagram as, you know, my main, um, my main platform. I release some videos on YouTube as well. But um, yeah, reach out to me, shoot me a DM, say what up. Um, I love connecting with each and every listener, whether it's on my own podcast or being on amazing podcasts like this with you, Justin. Um, feel free to reach out and I always respond. Awesome, Maddie. Thanks so much for spending some time with us today. And I'd like to end our show the way I always do, which is to encourage our audience to take some action today. Build the lifestyle that you desire, a life by design, not by default. So take one step towards achieving financial freedom today and watch what happens as you continually do that over time. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you next week.